On this episode, we visit Ottawa to learn about their new pedestrian plan. Then we examine the impact of neighborhood walkability on seniors. We look at traffic and sidewalks along Holland Avenue. Finally, tinted windows are a growing problem for pedestrians. Stay tuned. We're in Ottawa talking with Bob Stryker with the City of Ottawa. What do you do for the city? I'm actually, right, right now I'm acting manager of mobility and area traffic management. We have various programs to do with overall mobility issues uh, within the city and community tra uh, traffic planning and dealing with community traffic concerns. And Ottawa's been working on a pedestrian plan. Uh, how'd that get started? It, it's really a... Um, a follow-up of the city's overall planning process in looking longer term. It's 20, is looking to the year 2021. Uh, it has a transportation master plan which looks at converting or, or quite substantial change in improving transit ridership and getting alternatives to uh, uh, increased need for new roads um, and. Tr um, and pedestrian facilities is recognized as one of those significant forms of transportation. So this is sort of operationalizing the, the next level of, of how we implement a network or a pedestrian plan. How do you go about putting together a pedestrian plan? Where do you start? Well, this, this, this particular study is being done in, in three phases. The first part of, of the study was sort of to uh, to do data collection and research, find out what other uh, cities across North America sort of best practices research. Um, then the next stage was was actually to uh, to document and map what we have existing and to to work through the development of a plan network. And then the third stage, which we were, are about to embark on now, is really about programming and how do we encourage uh, and ensure that we enhance and educate the public into the benefits of the, our pedestrian network and the usage of that. And you're going to be out trying to outreach the public uh, with a with a finished plan. What's the role of the public been in in putting it together so far? We have on we've had two public open houses uh, thus far. There will be a final one where we present the draft plan. We have a public advisory committee on uh, that we've been working with. There's a technical advisory committee as well. We actually developed an online uh, survey. Uh, that's available to any member of the public to complete. And we're, we're looking for their input, their ideas. Uh, the first uh, open house was about just introducing the plan and getting basic ideas. Uh, the next was more, what, where are their issues? Um, what, uh, what, what problems do they, are they aware of? What is their vision of the future? What do they see? Uh, uh, are they types of improvements that we should be looking at? And are we looking at uh, just infrastructure or are there other, other aspects to it? Infrastructure is a significant part of it, but no, it, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's about programming. It's about changing attitudes. Um, it's about recognizing that um, uh, pedestrians are part of the transportation system. And, and that their needs need to be achieved. Uh, that it's, it's about understanding the needs of the pedestrians, that, that, that the facilities we provide are comfortable, that people feel safe, and it's about the maintenance of, of ensuring that the facilities are maintained to appropriate standards. And you're in Canada, you have snow in the winter. Does that give you maintenance problems? Well, certainly there's a cost. Um, for pedestrian, not all, all of our pedestrian facilities, in fact, are winter maintained. More, uh, we have facilities that are more intended towards uh, recreational activities, but those that are seen as part of the transportation network, the access for transit uses uh, to, to the transit stops and that, uh, the network has to be winter maintained. We need to clear the snow and ice from our uh, sidewalk facilities, and that, that's a significant cost for us. And you're going to be having the draft released to the public. Uh, 
uh, you'd be going through some sort of process to, to eventually finalize it, and, and what happens then? Well, what happens then is really uh, the implementation process. It's an ongoing process. It's, it's always intended to be that way. It, and th there will be an implementation strategy with this plan. And we've recognized that from some other plans that we've done, for example, with our cycling facility plan. Affordability is a significant issue. And so not all of uh, the things that we would like to do are, are, are likely to be realistic or achievable in the shorter term. So we, we will develop an implementation strategy and, and then year to year based on the money uh, that council uh, uh, are able to find for this program, we will implement those programs uh, as we go along. Now the other part that is happening, the city's overall planning process, it's mandated by the province, it be updated every five years. We're, that process is actually uh, beginning again and so this will tie into that process, but there's an overall visioning process again, and hopefully, um, you know, we will certainly hope be uh, pushing, sort of raising that, that awareness of the need for pedestrian facilities and the funding that's required for that. So this will be a stepping stone in, in achieving our long-term plan. We're at the University of Ottawa talking with Teresa Grant. How did you get interested in the issue of, of seniors and mobility? Well, I worked as a physiotherapist for the last 15 years and I've done a lot of work with seniors after stroke, um, the sorts of um, events that really render people um, dependent on others. And we spend a lot of time in rehabilitation, but when it comes down to it, um, if when we discharge um, folks to go home, if communities aren't supportive, they aren't able to maintain that independence and, and stay connected to community. So, uh, yeah, that's really where, where my interest in, in neighborhood walkability comes from. And what is it, uh, how did that lead to you being here at the university? Yeah, yeah well, uh, here at the University of Ottawa, there's a, a program in population health, and population health looks at um, the kinds of, of factors in society, like uh, social factors, economic, political, that influence the opportunities we have for healthy living. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you're working on a, a PhD now? Yes. Yes. And your dissertation topic? Uh, my dissertation is uh, has to do with neighborhood walkability for seniors, and also the social political processes that are associated with uh, the senior identified walkability issues. Um, and what to put it <laughs> simply? Yeah. What 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 sort of things are you going to be looking at when you when you're doing your research? Well, what I'm doing right now is going into four different neighborhoods in Ottawa. Uh, two of them are downtown neighborhoods, two of them are, are suburban. They contrast in terms of socioeconomic status. So um, two of the neighborhoods are lower income, two are, are higher income. And I'm asking seniors who live, who live in those neighborhoods to tell me about the positive aspects, the negative aspects of walking, and also how they see walkability to have changed in the last uh, decade. And then I'll be asking them how they think walkability could Im be improved. And by walkability, I'm talking about the characteristics that affect the enjoyment, the convenience, um, the safety of walking in the neighborhood. You're, you're, you're still fairly early in the process. Uh, what have you, you gleaned so far yes. from, from what you have yes. accomplished? Yes, well, I'm, I'm very early in the process. Um, so I, I hesitate to, to comment uh, too much, but obviously there, there are certain issues that are important to seniors. Um, in general, they have to do with four main things. Um, Micro-urban design issues, so si they often bring up the issue of sidewalks whether the sidewalks are level, the crack, uh, sidewalks having cracks, etc. Um, for seniors, often benches are an important issue. 
the opportunity to rest when they get tired. Um, having bathrooms along the route are, is also an issue um, for seniors that may, may not be an issue for everyone. Um, other kinds of things that come up, of course, are um, time, crosswalk times and feeling safe and having enough time to get across the street. Um, those, and certainly in the downtown neighborhoods, traffic um, always comes up as an issue and dealing with those traffic hazards. Uh, interestingly, in the suburban neighborhoods, I've talked to seniors about how they've seen certain changes occur and one of the issues that's come up so far is that uh, for example one senior said well I moved to this neighborhood because I could walk to the pharmacy and the post office um, and if the, I think she was close to a grocery store too and, and she said in the last 10 years all those places have closed and moved to a big box area where it's not so easy to walk around so uh, she drives her car, but again, inside the big box area, it's really not that pedestrian friendly. So she'll drive from store to store to get what she needs now r rather than walk. So th these are the kinds of issues that have come up so far. But again, I, I, won't, I haven't analyzed the, the data in any rigorous way yet. So When... Getting back to how you originally got involved in this, uh, if you have an area that, that seniors perceive as more walkable and, and perhaps this leads them to walk more, uh, what are the implications for their health? Well, and we, we certainly do see that some kinds of environments are associated with, um, with higher incidence of walking. And those kinds of areas tend to have higher density, um, mix, a mix of uses. So again, having um, shops and services within a 20 minute walk is a, is a large determinant of walking in the elderly. Um, from my perspective as a physiotherapist and a population health scientist, um, Physical activity is associated with all kinds of health problems, um, heart disease, diabetes, uh, stroke, um, and certainly within the elderly we see um, the problem of falls and again low activity rates uh, are a, a risk factor for falling um, and also just deconditioning and muscle weakness. So. Those are the kinds of things that, that uh, are associated with physical inactivity. And then, of course, there are the, the financial costs. And by age 75, an inactive um, woman, I, I have the data on women, not men, but uh, will cost the Canadian system twice as much as, uh, as somebody that has, has uh, maintained the, the adequate level of physical activity recommended by Health Canada. We're in Ottawa talking with Elaine McGregor. What's the street we're on? It's called Holland Avenue. It's a street in the near west end of the city. It's a nice uh, suburban area, fairly old. Most of the houses here were built in the 1930s and the 1940s and I've lived on this street for 21 years now. And how has the street changed over that time? Uh, the traffic's more than doubled. That's, that's probably the first and most noticeable thing about this street. I mean, the houses have mostly stayed the same. The, you know, the people around here have obviously moved and changed, but it's not, the, the character of the neighbourhood hasn't changed, but the amount of traffic has really affected us. It's one of the things that when every time you get people together in the area, you know, for a community meeting, the first thing they complain about is the traffic. They complain about, you know, too much cut through traffic. They complain about the noise. They complain about the buses going too fast. They complain about the speed because People, a lot of the uh, cars are going up to 20 kilometers an hour faster than uh, the actual speed limit. And it's, it's a real problem all the time here. It's, uh, this is also a neighborhood where a lot more people than average in Ottawa, uh, you can, if, I don't know if you heard that uh, screech, we do get a lot of those screeches. Uh, a lot of people around here do walk and cycle. My neighbor, for example, uh, will walk for uh, half an hour to get to the uh, 
grocery store every you know every day or every second day because she likes the walk. Uh, I get around uh, by either transit or by cycling or by walking. I, we don't own a car. We we have a, a car share, but we don't use it that often. And so, uh, for a lot of people around here, uh, it's very important to be able to to get around without using a car. And this is the kind of neighborhood that can allow you to do that, because. There's actually a very nearby shopping district. It's only about seven minutes walk away. And there's other stuff uh, further down uh, in the other direction that's about 15 minutes walk away. The library's 15 minutes walk away. There's uh, community centers about 18 minutes walk away. There's a lot of things that you can get to that are very, very accessible if you want to ride your, your bike or take the, uh, your walk or take transit. So there's no requirement, but we still get a lot of traffic from other neighborhoods going through here because we have a major hospital just in that direction. We have a major government uh, work, uh, work note in that direction, which you know, has uh, almost 10,000 people in it. We have, uh, you know, it's a lot of things around here where people want to get to. We also have a, a freeway exit that's just right over there. And furthermore, we're also going to have a major uh, road widening for one of the roads just south of us, about, uh, starts about uh, four kilometers south of us. And it's, this, it's going to be doubled in size in the next few years. And we really get worried that there's going to be so much traffic coming through here that it's going to be harder and harder for people to just live on the street. And that's one of the, the constant problems we have in this. You know, it's a, it's a good, work, livable neighborhood. A lot of people here aren't contributing to the traffic problem, but we're getting everybody else's traffic. Uh, physically, how has the street changed? Physically, the um, it's still the, uh, it's about the same width, but one of the things a few years ago when they had to completely replace all the sewers and uh, water lines underneath the street, we did manage to get the sidewalk slightly widened, and we did manage to get um, some bulb outs. I don't know if you can see in in the distance over there, but at every intersection we managed to get some bulb outs that we actually put in to coincide with the uh, bus stops and. And what that did is it more clearly defined where people uh, park on the street and encouraged people actually to park on the street. And that had a little bit of a, a traffic calming uh, effect on the street. And so the traffic, the, the average traffic speed has dropped probably by, by about five, five to seven kilometers an hour. And that's helped. So that, that was, a, that was a, a bit of an improvement here. Because, well, we had to fight like crazy because the, uh, the transit authority didn't actually want us to uh, have a uh, you know to to actually block off a transit lane because they said well we want to use this for transit priority and we said well you've still got a major lane in there and it's not that crowded and if we allow you to have four major traffic lanes here it's just going to become impossible to live on and it's not going to get any better for transit if you just keep uh, shoving more and more cars down here at some point you've got to actually say transit priority so they've put a transit priority little uh, area of just to the south of us here, but other than that, they 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 decided finally that they could actually manage to uh, live with just two two through traffic lanes, and it actually has ended up working. When they rebuilt your sidewalk, uh, you say they made it a little wider. What else did they do with it? Well, one of the things we really had to fight for when we had this road reconstructed was to change the design of the sidewalks, because one of the main problems for people who walk in Ottawa is the winter conditions. Uh, here, it's actually it, it tends to cycle around freezing a lot in the, in the winter. So if it stayed below freezing, it wouldn't be a problem because you just get nice uh, crunchy snow and it's easy to walk on. And if it stayed above zero, well, the sidewalks would be clear. But what we get is that we get a lot of freezing rain and we get a lot of cases where the, uh, the sidewalks melt and then they freeze and then they melt and then they freeze. And the standard sidewalk design that used to be in the uh, city of Ottawa is what I would call, even though the, the the, uh, what the, the engineers call it the traditional design. I call it the roller coaster design. And the reason why I call it the roller coaster design is because at every single uh, uh, intersection, every single driveway, and I, I know if you can see on this road, there are huge numbers of driveways. I counted one block on the street, had 18 driveways. You know, So at every, every driveway, it would dip down. So you, what, it, what that meant is that you had a nice little place where it would accumulate water. And particularly because we have uh, ice and snow accumulated at the side of the street, what would happen was that you'd get the ice and snow at the side of the street, and then you'd get the water in the driveway, and it would be like this little skating rink, you know, 18 times per block. And this was totally impossible to walk on. Plus, what would happen is that the, the pitch of the sidewalk would keep changing every time you went down. So it would be like 
First of all, it would be like this towards the road. Then it would be like this towards here, and would go up, and then it would go down, and go up. And so when you have a constantly changing pitch on your sidewalk, again, it makes it very difficult to walk on, particularly for elderly people. And there are a fair number of elderly people in this neighborhood, but not even for them. I mean, because I've fallen numerous times on this sidewalk, just, just walking along. The only way to be really safe is you actually had to get uh, grippers on your on your uh, shoe, on your boots and actually wear those, you know, so you could actually, actually stick into the ice in the winter. So we, at some point, we just said, a bunch of us who lived around this area said, this is stupid. There's got to be a better way. And we went down to Toronto and we looked at Toronto and we realized that Toronto had a different design where they actually had the portion of the sidewalk that was nearest the uh, houses stayed essentially flat and then they would actually have more of a grade right near the, act, the, the road to handle the uh, right at driveways so that there wasn't this actual dip ev at every driveway. And we said, well, look, this has got to be better because it won't have the same problem. It's less likely to accumulate lots of ice. And so we took this to city, to, uh, city staff and we kept pushing and pushing and the city staff were totally unwilling to actually change it. And then we took, so we finally took it to city councillors and city councillors said, Everybody complains about the icy sidewalks. And they said, we've heard this over and over again. This was like every older neighborhood in the city. The councillors for this said, there's got to be a better way. We like your idea. Please pick it. You know, they went over and over again and said, we got, you know, we got to do something different. And we fought and we fought and we fought. And finally, they, you know, after uh, going back and forth, they, they consulted with everybody. You know, every advisory, practically every possible advisory committee. They, they talked to the disabled committee, of course, because you've got to make sure that this is going to handle the wheelchairs. And we figured, yes, it could handle the wheelchairs. It was going to be wide enough. It was going to allow... It wasn't, it wasn't perfect, but the problem is that the perfect design would, have to, would mean that you'd have to have much even wider sidewalks than what we have now, and you need a boulevard so that you could actually have the, uh, the, the indentation going in the boulevard section. But the only way they could have done that is by pulling out a lane of parking here and no one was willing to do that. So this was the best compromise for what we had here. We're in Ottawa talking with Barry Weller. What got you interested in the issue of tinted windows? Well, John, this actually goes back to the Walking Security Index project that we did for the region of Ottawa Carlton beginning in 1995. When we were doing the counts and studies at intersections, one of the things we noticed and, and kept coming to mind was the, the comment to children to always make eye contact with drivers, which of course is good advice for everybody. And then we realized that one of the problems is tinted windows. They can have, you can have a tinted windshield, you can have a tinted window, uh, either on the driver's side or the passenger side, and the problem is you're not guaranteed that you've actually made eye contact because you can't see this person. The difficulty was the tinted windows did not fit into the research design that had been approved by the region of Ottawa Carlton. I was designing a driver behavior index, a quality of intersection condition index, and an intersection volume design index. So we knew, I knew there was a problem with tinted windows, but they couldn't fit it into that research. So as soon as that research was over, I began to raise questions uh, with the, I mean, we, we made the point but I couldn't really fund, I couldn't really get involved in research because I was in contract for another project. So we made the point that this was difficult, and then once that project was over, then I began to pursue it with considerable zeal. And so I made a uh, presentation to the Ottawa Police Services Board, sent materials to the Minister of Transport for the Province of Ontario, and the question was raised about the definition of window tinting. Why would you have any window tinting? other than perhaps the top 15 centimeters at the top of the windshield, why should there be any tinting of windows? Because what it does is it affects safety of, dri uh, safety of pedestrians who can't make uh, uh, eye contact with drivers. So I sent out a, a series of letters and in fact the Ottawa Police Services Board totally agreed. They sent letters to the province of Ontario and said in effect this isn't just bad for pedestrians, this is bad for police officers. Because the problem is you're approaching a vehicle and you have no idea what's in there. You know, it could be anybody. You know, somebody could be sitting there with you know, three or four shotguns aimed at a policeman. This is not, this is not nice. So the police themselves were not happy about the, the fact that tinted windows were allowed at all. So they agreed there should be no window tinting. Numerous letters to the province of Ontario and the federal government led to what's known as the runaround. 
they just absolutely dug in their heels uh, and ignored it. So I just simply said, look, I've created a paper trail here, and in the event there's a lawsuit, there's going to be a whole pile of people who are going to get named. Because in the event that the tinted window is, is brought forward as a cause of a crash, cause of a death, cause of an injury, you people are all going to have to be named. And here it is, I've, I've, I've created the paper trail. Well, I've now looked at some material coming out of the Solicitor General's office for the province of Ontario, and he is very concerned with uh, vehicles that are souped up. They're souped up for racing, etc., etc. Well, we have in the province of Ontario right now, really, I think, an epidemic of window tinting. The windshields are tinted, the side windows are tinted, and I think if the police and the courts had acted on this four or five years ago, this problem would never have gotten to where it is. But it's, it's, it boils down to the bylaw or the law in the Highway Traffic Act pretty much being ignored. Uh, the police really can't seem to deal with it. They seem to, they're concerned that the, the cases get thrown out in court. And the argument is, well, we really can't tell. So once you, once you allow a degree of window tending, the question is, well, who knew? And so that was why it goes back to, then you don't have any. If it has to be clear, it has to be clear. And uh, then if you have any tinting, then you've clearly violated and uh, there's no problem getting a conviction. So the vehicle window tinting is, uh, I get emails on that from people who, who are calling to ask, what's happening? Like, it's not my job. I mean, I'm not in charge of window tinting. I just happen to bring the point. So it's obviously is a, a, a serious concern on the part of pedestrians and pedestrian groups and even on the part of drivers who are very concerned that you can't see. I mean, you can be six feet from a car window and you can't, you wouldn't, a dog could be driving. Uh, the driver could be dead. You actually can't see anything in some of these windows. They're so dark. So I'm, I'm optimistic that this, uh, this next letter to the Solicitor General for the province of Ontario will do something. But this is not just Ontario's problem. The United States has different legislation in states as well as to how much window tending is allowed, how much windshield tending is allowed. And I'm sure in the area of Washington, D.C., you have seen windows that are illegally tinted. Well, you can't see the driver there either. Or am I wrong? No, we, uh, we see some pretty dark windows, uh, even down the States. And, and the question is, why are they tinted? And it turns out it's cosmetics. It has nothing to do with anything else. There are ways to refract the sun so that it does not come inside the car. It's cosmetics, and it's a dangerous form of cosmetic. And the notion that cosmetic would be allowed to take a preference over safety is disgusting. Quite frankly, it's disgusting. Under no circumstances should you ever compromise a pedestrian's safety for a vehicle operator's cosmetics. That is just flat out illogical. That is not the sign of a civilized society. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.